what's going on, everybody? Once again, back, it's the incredible Dale Valor's Inner Game podcast. And the last few episodes have been so dope, man. I, I've been putting these things out consistently every week. And if you've been checking for them, you know, you know the information that you've been getting has just been top tier. I've been getting so much feedback from you guys just letting me know, you know, the, the stuff that you're getting out of it. And, and I love that because... I love to seeing people uh, transform and level up and grow. And that's what this is all about. If you don't know what inner game is, and that is really the emphasis here of this podcast, it is the relationship that you have with yourself. And if you do not have a good relationship with yourself, how can you ever have a good relationship, whether it be romantically, whether it's in business, whether even your health, your mental health, like, there's so many uh, uh, characteristics and, and layers to that onion. And so I want to get to the the core of that onion and get that sorted out so as that you can go out there and start having the type of relationships that you want because the relationship with good is good with you, right? And so to my left or your right, depending on how you're viewing this, <laughs> um, I am my trusted confidant, crossbow killer once again. <laughs> you know you know i'm gonna joke about that every single time yep yep i've got like i don't even know man it ought to change the name to that i'm just like i just made peace with it i'm not changing it <laughs> so shabam's over here with me he's in here for every episode and uh so glad glad he's here but i wanted to bring on a guest for this particular episode and I really want to dive deep on to what he does. And I, now I know a little bit, you know, the, uh, just, just a little, uh, just based on the fact that I went through a very transformative experience a couple of weeks uh, with this man's guidance. And what he is, is a, a shaman, a black magic practitioner, <laughs> uh, architect of transformation, <laughs> you know, but really the real deal is, uh, he's got a great backstory from where he came from to where he is now and what he's doing with guys. And we're talking about hundreds of different people's. Uh, and by the way, you're going to have to excuse if my uh, my camera does that every once in a while. Uh, Modern flirting is going to have to uh, spring for a new webcam for me. I got a feeling here soon. So, <laughs> you know, we'll see what happens. But uh, that being said, this guy has worked with hundreds of individuals, helping them to level up, helping them to transform through a process. Now, I, I'll get into uh, my role in that and in, in what, 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 what uh, we had worked through, but I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. We got Zach here, uh, again, the shaman, which I know you, like, which is crazy because, like, you know, when I picture a shaman, like, you're not the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh I'm gonna not totally sure how to take that. You know, I I imagine as you picture uh if you'd seen me a couple of years ago, you know, back when I had the long hair and the crazy, the whole crazy look. Yeah, that's uh, what yeah. Yeah. that's what we are thinking about. Yeah. Are you familiar? <laughs> are you familiar with Steve P? I no, I don't think so. Okay, I used to work with a guy named Hypnotica. When I think of a shaman, I that's what I think of. You know what I mean? So if anybody out there knows who Steve P is. Like that's yeah. in my mind exactly how I envision it. But yeah, so you know, um, can you just kind of break down what it is that you do, like how you got into it, kind of a little bit of uh your story and uh and then let's go from there. Yeah, man, for sure. So at the end of the day, what I do is I help men unlock the absolute best version of themselves so that they can live up to their potential and really be somebody that's proud of what they see when they look in the mirror. Now, for me, I never really felt like a man. You know, I always struggled with self-doubt and anxiety and fear and insecurity. And I never really felt like I had my purpose in the world, which I know a lot of guys out there can relate to. And for me, you know, I had this, this desire. I had this drive inside of me. And I knew that there was something. Right? I knew I was capable of greatness and that I had a lot that I could do. But I just didn't know what or how to do it. So I decided that I was going to join the military. I figured I would get out of my hometown, travel, adventure, see the world, and toughen up and become a man in the process. So while I was looking around for options, though, I read a story about the first Navy SEALs to die in Afghanistan. 
And this story just grabbed me, hook, line, and sinker. And the stories of brotherhood and heroism and sacrifice and this willingness to put it all on the line and run out into open gunfire to rescue a brother just hit me at such a deep level that it moved something in me so profound that I said, that's it, I'm going to become a Navy SEAL. Now, here's the problem. I, you know, you look at me now, I'm- Can't uh, swim. <laughs> I can swim a little bit, but uh, even worse than that, if I were to show you a picture of me uh, back then, you know, people see me now and I'm, you know, I'm about 180 pounds, I'm covered in tattoos, so people think I've always looked like this, but no. Back when this decision was made, I weighed a buck 20, like soaking wet, right? Fresh out of the pool, 120 pounds, 510, not a good ratio. I looked more like Machine Gun Kelly than Jocko. And mm -hmm. this is going to be a problem for going into the toughest military training in the world. So yep. this was the first time in my life that I realized that I couldn't do it on my own and I needed some help from somebody who'd been there before. So I turned to the internet and I started going through forums and stories. And this was back in, you know, the late, early 2000s, before YouTube was a big thing, before, you know, you had access to every single influencer on it. I think this is before Instagram even existed. And you had to really had to dig to find some information. And during my digging, I found a story from a former SEAL and it was titled, So You Think You Want to Be a Navy SEAL, huh? And I read it and it was just this gritty, raw, real deal breakdown of exactly what that life is like. And by the time I got to the end of it, I was like, yep, that's my guy. Now, what really drew me to him though, was the fact that in the signature, it said owner of CrossFit Bellevue. So I do a little Googling and it turns out he runs a CrossFit gym 10 minutes from my parents' house. Oh, where wow. I was living at. That's crazy. Huh. Was yeah. talk about, you know, this is probably one of the first times in hindsight that the universe really conspired to take me where I, on the journey I needed to go. So I promptly drove down there, walked in. I was expecting to see some big, you know, Jocko, GI Joe looking yeah. all American mm -hmm. guy. And, you know, I see a bunch of people working out in the corner. There's this like pissed off fat Mexican guy. And I'm like, oh, I'll go. He looks like he's works here. I'll go talk to this guy. So I walk up and I'm like, hey, excuse me. And I'm looking for Dan. He doesn't even, without even looking up, he goes, yeah, I'm Dan. What do you want? I'm like, whoa. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a, more of a bark than a response. And <laughs> you go, oh, yeah, my name is Zach and I'm uh, joining the Navy and I'm going to SEAL training. I want to be, I'm going to be a SEAL. He looks up at me, just this look, and I'll never forget this. Just looks up at me with this look that might as well have said, really, motherfucker? <laughs> and you know, look me up and down and I, he almost lives if he was expecting to laugh like I was playing a joke on him. And I'm like, oh, I'm serious. And he goes, all right, uh, see these guys working out, climbing ropes and lifting heavy weights? Yep, go join the workout. Go do go do the stuff with the, those people. So I go in. Now, mm -hmm. I have never climbed a rope in my life except for like, you know, elementary school PE class. <laughs> and I've never lifted a weight, like never, never, right? I kind of got in the gym a little bit, but I never really like knew how to do any of these lifts. So... Mm -hmm. I try to do a squat. It was my first one. Not even not even with weight, right? Just body weight. Squat my you know squat down and stand back up. And my legs were so weak and skinny that I fell on my ass. <laughs> I just rolled out on the floor. Oh, God, I was going to get back up. I'm like, let me try that again. Go down, mm -hmm. fell up again. I'm like, what is going on here? Like every time I'd fall down though, I'd get back up. And I move on to the rope climb. Try to climb up the rope, I fall down. Try to climb up the rope, I fall down. And I lost track of the number of times that I fell down on that day. But every time I fell down, I stood back up until he said, stop. Walks over to me and says, look, you're weak and pathetic and you have no business being here, but clearly you have heart and you want to do it. So I'll train you here. Be here at 6 a.m. tomorrow for training. And if you're going to be late, don't even bother showing up. So I show up and I spent the next year going through my own personal Rocky montage of Three a day workouts, swims in the freezing cold lake, getting push ups and yelled at, and all the kind of the typical stuff you'd expect huh. from the military. What is going on here? Uh, until next thing I know, it's time to ship out. Yeah. It's time to head off to boot camp. So, yeah. boot camp, um, boot camp is the most boring thing in the world. Uh, they basically spend two months teaching how to fold your clothes and shut the fuck up and march in a straight line. Can I swear on this? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're good. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go for it. I don't want to mess up your guys' like... Uh, no, no, no. Shabam cusses like a sailor. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, boot camp, bored out of my mind. And then I show up to Bud's, which is SEAL training. 
and I'm mentally and physically prepared. You know, it's now, hard. Let me, right? let me stop you real quick. Yeah. Can you sign up for a SEAL trip or to, to, to be a SEAL or is it a selective thing like you? Let's go. Yeah. So it used That's to be a, well, you, the old way was you had to join the military, pick a job, go through the school, do all that stuff. And then you could apply for SEAL training okay. like down the road. Huh. However, after the 9-11 war on terror, as they were scaling up and realizing how important special operations were mm -hmm. for winning this war on terror, whatever that is, um, they decided to create a direct pipeline. Okay. You had all these you know, young, tough, pissed off American boys that wanted to go become SEALs and go to war and do this. So they created just a straight in pipeline. So. Okay. I went through, you know, you've got to go through some qualifications, right? You've got to pass some running and swimming and push-ups and sure. some mental stuff where they want to make sure you're you're crazy, but not too crazy. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to jump through some hoops and it's highly competitive. Yeah. You know, I got lucky that I got in before the real big rush came in and I still waited a year to ship out. I think now there's probably a multi-year waiting list oh, wow. and it's just unbelievably competitive, you know? So, but yeah, the way we were set up is we go boot camp and then uh, Bud's Prep, which is basically where you spend a few months getting back all the shape and all the fitness that you lost in boot camp, yeah. And then from there, you know, that's, I, there's plenty of stories I could tell about that, but let's just say a bunch of young men with too much money and no real responsibilities other than working out three times a day. Yeah. Uh, you can get in some trouble. So, <laughs> you know, you're on a base with a bunch of other sailors and a bunch of girls that are fresh out of boot camp. It's, you know, you can, you can imagine how these things go. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. it was a good time for a couple of months. Then I show up in San Diego, California, ready for SEAL training. And, you know, I thought I knew what to expect. Uh, it's, no matter how many YouTube videos you watch, no matter how many, you know, no matter how many hours you train in the gym, nothing prepares you for really just getting punched in the face mm -hmm. or kicked in the dick. Yeah. And this is just a straight up kick to the dick. It's <laughs> just as hard as it looks online. It's yeah. every bit as intense as it's made out to be, but it's also doable. Right. Uh, some number of hundreds of guys completed that. Actually, I don't even know if it's that much, but thousands of guys show up every year and at least a couple hundred of them make it through. Right. So it's, it's doable. And that was my biggest yeah. thing going through this was I realized, OK, I may not be the biggest or the fastest or the strongest, but dumber, less capable motherfuckers than me have done this. So if they did it, I can do it. And that kind of became the rallying call for my life. Right. Is if they did it, I can do it. And so I always look at that as to who is. Who has already achieved so what i want to achieve you know with less resources less capability less intelligence than me if they did it i can do it so go through seal training it's you know we showed up with 255 guys on day one and by the end of hell week and if you're not familiar hell week is a five and a half day stretch where you don't sleep you run i think like 250 miles with a heavy boat on your head and it's just it's designed to get you to quit it's designed to push you to your breaking point where they're looking for the guys who can't hang, who are mentally weak and they will find your weakness and they will exploit it. And, you know, I even had a moment, you know, for the most part I was good, but there was a moment where I almost broke and they almost, they almost broke me, but they didn't. So get through hell week, get through all that. And I'm thinking I'm, you know, on top of the world, I'm the shit, you know, I got the brown shirt that signifies you completed hell week. I'm the man, blah, blah. Um, next thing I know, I am waking up in the hospital out of a coma with a life altering brain injury. And I come to find out that the couple nights ago when I was out, I was walking home one night. It was in a crosswalk. I was actually taking some girl home that I'd met at the bar. You know, the, the pride comes before the fall, truly. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm sitting there on one level. I'm like, yeah, I'm about to be a Navy SEAL. I'm the shit. Another one, I'm taking this chick home from the bar. I'm about to get laid. And mm -hmm. that's when the hand of God, destiny, the universe, whatever you want to call it, reached down and bitch slapped me out of that lane. And Dude, that hard, huh? That hard. <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, it was, to say it was painful would be putting it lightly. You know, it, it felt like I was dying. Well, what happened? Did you get hit by a car? Yeah, I was in a crosswalk, uh, you know, with this girl and yeah. a drunk driver blew through the intersection oh. at about 40 miles an hour. And my body left the ground, my feet left the ground, and my head was the first thing to hit. Oh, Hmm. How was she? What happened to her? Uh, she was okay. I like to think, you know, I don't remember any of this, but I like to think I heroically pushed her out of the way and bore the brunt of the of the vehicle mm -hmm. impact. You know, she was she was shaken up and yeah. probably a little traumatized from mm -hmm. from uh, died. Doing that. You know, yeah. I, I died, but 
it, and they, when I got out of the hospital, funny thing is actually when I got out of the hospital, she actually was the first person to come over and spent the night with me that night while I was high out of my mind on Vicodin and whatever else <laughs> yeah. the hospital would pump me full of. Um, but you know, I, so that, that worked out. We ended up seeing each other for a few months, Okay. but I was, you know, this was a, you know, the beginning of the end for me because, you know, I'd had this dream, this identity, this thing I'd worked so hard to create and build myself up to. And all of a sudden it was taken away from me, mm-hmm. like just like that, right? And life can really change in an instant. And it's crazy how fast things can change. You know, one minute you're on top of the world, you think everything's going for you. And the next thing you know, you're waking up in the hospital out of a coma with a brain injury, right? But it can also go the other way. You know, you can be at rock bottom and you can think it's hopeless and helpless and nothing is ever going to work and you should just throw in the towel and give up. But you'd be surprised at how quickly things can change. And sometimes it just takes one moment to really turn things around and create that lasting positive change. So these days I try to remember that too, is that, you know, nothing lasts forever, Mm -hmm. right? Life is a wheel, right? You go up and then you're down. It's all temporary. Yep. It It lasts forever. Right. Good or bad, so just try to try to enjoy the ride as best you can. That's what my my philosophy these days. But at the time, you know, this was the this was devastating. You know, devastated would be putting it lightly. You know, I this dream that I'd worked so hard for, this vision, this goal, this big thing that I'd put so much pride and effort into was gone. So I downward spiraled, depression, anxiety, suicidalness. I don't know if that's a word. Um which is a really, really dark time. You know, I was reckless. I was the part of my brain that was damaged was responsible for like mood, impulse control, emotion, personality. So I was making reckless. It's amazing. I didn't die. The, amazing. It, I didn't die somehow at that time. Um, and it spiraled for a good number of years until, you know, and I got a girlfriend and that kind of helped and I got a dog and that gave me something to live for. Got a new job at the fire department and that was okay, but nothing really like fixed the underlying sense of like something is broken. Something is wrong with me. Yeah. Right. I'm unhappy no matter what I do. I'll never be happy, never be worthy. Like there was just this underlying feeling of brokenness. And if I'm being honest, it was there before, mm-hmm. right? It was, it's what pushed me into the military. It's what pushed me to seek all this out in myself and having that brain injury just blew that thing wide open. And now it was, it went from a, a low simmer to a roiling boil that was threatening to blow up in my face and just destroy everything. So I knew I was in trouble. And the hardest thing for the man, the absolute hardest thing in the world for a man is to acknowledge that he has a problem and then admit that he needs help, especially from another man. There's just, we have pride, we have ego. We're told that men don't have emotions to suck it up, to tough it out, to man up to suffer in silence. Like we're told all this stuff. And so we bottle it down and we tell people we're fine. We tell people everything is okay when we're not. And we really get really good at lying to ourselves and lying to everybody else around us. And I'd perfected this mask, this mask of looking like everything was fine while on the inside, it felt like I was broken and I was really dying on the inside. So this came to a breaking point though, when I realized that I did need help and I was laying on my couch imagining all the different ways that I could kill myself without it looking like a suicide. And this got really dark, like unbelievably dark, like newsworthy dark um, levels was where my mind was at at the time. And I just had this chilling moment where I'm like, that's not me. That's not who I want to be. That's not how I want my story to go. I need help. I can't do this on my own. Like I've been trying, I've tried everything. I tried the books and the YouTube and the meditating and the gym and all the stuff and none of it was working. So I decided that, I was going to do the hardest thing in the world and ask another man for help. Now, fortunately, that like okay. that, all that other stuff that takes all that time, that takes all that effort and energy, you know, a process of elimination. Yeah. Okay. That didn't work. Okay. That didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't work. When you could have just simply asked for help right from the get, like that, that that's crazy. You know, like the, you're right. The guys hang on to that mentality, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's so simple. You know, it's in hindsight, if I'd asked for help sooner, I could have saved myself years of yeah. pain and suffering and wasted time trying to figure it out on my own. But we have egos, right? The ego will lie to you and the ego will tell you that, oh, you're close. You can figure it out on your own. Oh, maybe you just haven't tried meditating enough. Maybe you haven't worked out enough. Maybe you just need to watch one more video, one more book, one more this, one more that. 
right? The ego, you get really good at deluding yourself into thinking that things are just going to work themselves out. But the more I tried to push against that and figure it out on my own, the darker I got, the worse things got until I found myself in a worse situation than I was in before. And if I hadn't reached out and asked for help, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Mm -hmm. And you would know me, you wouldn't know who me, best case scenario, you wouldn't know me. Worst case scenario, you would have known me for doing something pretty fucking horrible yeah. to other people. So, you know, it's, it's amazing how and it, it takes strength, right? People are like, oh, it's vulnerable, it's weak, bullshit. It takes more yeah. strength to be vulnerable and ask for help than it does to thump on your chest and pretend you're tough and act like everything is fine. That, that is actually weakness. Right. Trying to act like you're tough and act like everything is good and act like this raw, emotionless robot. That's that's weakness. That's weakness and that's fear from being afraid to actually express who you really are and how you really feel. It takes unbelievable strength and courage to reach out and ask for help, to admit that you have a problem and to acknowledge that you've tried on your own and it's just not getting handled. So I'm always very, very understanding and appreciative of people when they come to me in that state because I get it. It's scary it's it feels like admitting defeat it feels like admitting failure in a lot of ways but it's not it's actually taking the first step towards a new better future that is so bright like you can't even possibly imagine it but it does take that first step of courage you know i think of that scene in indiana jones where uh, he's like trying to look at how to get across this big gap and mm. like i can't jump that no man can jump that and they tell him to take a leap of faith and so he takes that first step you know, prepared to crash, prepared to burn. And what he finds is that there's actually footing. And then he takes another step and another step. And he realizes that the way forward was there all the time, but he couldn't see it until he took that first step. Yeah. That's and great. So that's really, so that's one of just one of my, so, um, yeah. So this mentor, he puts me in contact with this group that does, so this mentor puts me in contact with this group that does psychedelic treatments for veterans with brain injuries. And I never got into drugs. I never, you know, I'd taken mushrooms here and there, dabbled, okay, cool, whatever. But I never really like, gotten into the psychedelic world. Right? I kind of knew it was there, but I always thought it was just these weird hippie losers that, you know, Same. weren't doing anything with their lives. <laughs> you know, thank you, uh, thank you, 70s propaganda. <laughs> and <laughs> so the next thing I know, I find myself off the grid in Mexico in this most incredible healing house. And I'm just surrounded by people that are full of warm, radiant, soothing energy. And it was just an experience. It was a contained, I'd never been in a, in a situation like this before. And I didn't really know what I was getting into. I knew I was going to do some sort of psychedelic something or other, but I didn't, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So first thing they do is they administer a medicine called Ibogaine. Now, if you haven't heard of this, it's a root from Africa that's been used as medicine over there for thousands of years that is now just now finding its way into Western mainstream. And the reason it's becoming so known is because it is unbelievably powerful. It's also not recommended for most people. It, in order to do this, you have to get a blood test to make sure that your uh, your kidneys are working and your body, your, your chemistry is okay. You have to get a heart monitor you know, an EKG to make sure your heart is okay. You have to be hooked up to an IV and there's a full on medical staff during this procedure. Damn. So there's a really yeah. cool blend of Western medicine and spirituality in a very, very unique container for healing. And so we take the Ibogaine, it's very ceremonial, very medicinal and go lay down. And the best way I can describe this experience is it was like 14 hours of my own personalized custom version of hell. When I say that, I mean, imagine spending the night, all night, the longest night of your life in a dream state, reliving every single painful, dark, traumatic, miserable memory from your entire life, starting from the moment of birth up until now, reliving it, not just watching it, but actually being dropped into the scene and remembering that's what it looked like. That's what it sounded like. That's what it felt like. I got that for 12 hours straight. I got to watch the negative reel of my life. And by the time I came out of it, I understood myself and my path and my journey better than I've ever understood myself in my entire life. But I also felt broken. I realized that my life had been this symphony of pain and bad experiences and failures and all these negative things. And that's why I hated myself and felt bad about my life and didn't like who I was. 
fortunately, there's a two-part treatment and mm -hmm. the Ibogaine is followed up with a different medicine called 5-MeO-DMT, which is not to be confused with regular DMT. This is, uh, it's really psychedelic toad poison that you vaporize through a medical grade crack pipe is the, the best way that I can describe it. But the experience is truly indescribable. And I guess, you know, it's it's referred to as the God molecule. That's the nickname that this, this natural substance is given. And once you have this experience, you'll, you'll tend to agree. It was an unbelievable, it was a cleansing experience. You know, I, I went to this place of white light and peace and love and happiness and saw and felt all these things that I'd never felt my entire life. I'd been so closed off to due to being trapped in the darkness and the negativity. And I was struggling with it because I couldn't let it into me. I was feeling it outside of me, but I wasn't feeling it inside in me. And this was causing me an unbelievable amount of distress until I just made a moment of decision in which I went back to my younger self in one of the kind of the, the big traumatic memory, if you will. And I pulled him out of that memory, gave him a hug and said, I love you. You're a good person and you deserve to be happy. And that was the moment that the walls came down and like a garden hose being turned on the darkness got flushed out of me and washed away by light and love and joy and peace and all these feelings that I'd never felt for my entire life. 30, I think I was 31 when I went through this, 31 years on this planet, never felt joy, never felt peace, never felt love or happiness. And all of a sudden, like a light switch, it was on inside of me. And I came out of this experience. And for the first time ever, I realized that there's people that need help. And it's not all about me. It's not all about what's going on with me and being self-centered and being wallowing in my own misery. It's about, there's other people that need help. And I was so grateful for this experience that I started volunteering with this organization and helping other veterans go through these experiences. And during the two years that I was doing that, I witnessed what I can only describe as miracles. You know, families healed, people that were about to kill themselves, turn things around, you know, businesses started, lives rebuilt, like it's, you name it. I've just, I've witnessed things that are absolutely incredible. And it lit this fire in me that, you know, I thought my purpose was to be a warrior, right? I thought I was here to go to war and kick indoors and shoot bad guys in the face, you know, which sounded cool when I was young and pissed off. <laughs> but I realized that, you know, and there's no doubt in my mind, I would have been good at it, right? I was committed. I went through it. I like, there's no doubt in my mind, I would have made a great warrior, but I also think I would have gotten killed trying to prove myself. But I had this need to prove myself, this desire for to show people how great I was. And there's a, I genuinely believe I would have gotten killed trying to prove myself. So that was not my calling. So instead, I discovered that there was great fulfillment and great joy in helping people and helping people to heal and rebuild. And some guys just started asking me to coach them. And I did without really knowing what I was doing, but I found out I had a natural knack for it. Flash forward, you know, a few years later, you know, that moment, right? the big epiphany that I took out of that experience was everything that happened, happened. And no matter what happened, the big epiphany that I took away from that experience was that whatever happened, happened. The past is the past and there's no way to go back and change what happened. But instead of dwelling on the past and focusing on everything that went wrong, I can start right now and decide where it goes next. And more importantly, where it ultimately ends up. And that simple shift in my thinking, in the way that I saw myself and my power in life, gave me the platform and the ability to rewrite my life. So I asked myself, where do I want to end up? What do I actually want my life to look like? What are the habits that I need to take to get there? Right? I have a specific destination in mind. What are the habits I need? What do I need to start doing, stop doing? I need accountability. Right? I realized that I can't do it on my own, so I do need other people to help me and support me along the way. And I realized I was also burning myself out. I was trying so hard. I wasn't resting or enjoying life or having any fun. And using what I learned from the SEALs, I learned how to track my progress. So create a plan, track the plan, measure the plan, and actually started to see tangible, noticeable results across different areas of my life. You know, I got back in shape, worked on my fitness, and decided to get my dating and my social life figured out. Decided to start a business and learn how to actually make money, giving value to people and helping other people. And... It doesn't happen overnight, right? Anybody that tells you it's instant results is, is lying to you or trying to sell you something. Yeah. But 
with consistent, steady effort over time and keeping around the big picture, progress is inevitable when you have those five pieces that I just described. And I actually wrapped those into my methodology and I call it the shark method, right? It starts with getting specific on your outcome, dialing in the habits to get there, keeping yourself accountable to get there, both internally and with other people, resting and recharging so that you actually have energy and enjoy life, and then keeping track of progress along the way so that you actually know where you are and what to be working on next. I thought for sure the K was going to be killing it. (laughs) I might rebrand actually. I like that. I like that. That's better. (laughs) (laughs) So cool. All right. Super dope, man. I mean, man, what, what, what a heck of a story, you know, like a origin story, background story. I'm, I'm always big on people's like where they came from, you know, because it, it, I find that to be so powerful because it's like, look at where they're at now. Like people like have this idea that, you know, people that are successful, just bloop, they're just successful. Like they just were born successful and you know what I mean? And that is rarely the case. And even the cases where somebody was born into, we'll say some type of um, privileged type of atmosphere, they still have to maintain that. Because all that could be lost if they get, you know, go down the wrong paths and get hooked on heroin or meth or something or do a bunch of crazy stuff. Everything that they got could be gone. So they still have to maintain that, you know? And so to to hear your story and everything, man, that's just like so impactful. Now, I love I love the uh, the shark um, uh, uh, analogy, too, you know, and sharks don't sleep. So although you do have. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or I guess they, they do sleep, but they can't stop moving or something, right? Yeah. You sleep, they know when to rest. They know when to slow down. They, yeah. they sleep while moving for sure. Yeah. And I can appreciate what you said too. You know, one of the greatest gifts that my parents ever gave me was not giving me shit. No. I grew up in a, a fairly wealthy neighborhood, right? I was the I was the poor kid in the rich neighborhood, right? So in a school where it was customary, you know, you turn 16 and your parents buy you a BMW or a Mercedes or something nice. You know, I turned 16. I'm like, hey, I want a car. And my dad said, like, cool, get a job. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> right. now, to, to be fair, right? My, my dad, my mom, they're, they're absolutely great. They did everything they possibly could have for me. They gave me the world, but there was no entitlement, right? So it was get a job and work and I will sell you my old car. I'll give you a deal on it. That's the same right. with me, dude. Same, yeah. same exact thing, you know? Yes. And it brings this... You know, you, you get to appreciate things, right? I think there's a there's a well-known phenomenon where the children of rich, wealthy parents oftentimes turn out to be drug addicts, you know, losers that don't actually do, any, do anything in life because you haven't had to earn it. Or you haven't had to earn it or appreciate it. And there's just something that comes from going through the shit and suffering and slogging it out and working your ass off for no results day in, day out and getting frustrated and pushing through all that to ultimately see the results on the other side. And a lot of times, like the only way to have true fulfillment and true joy and true meaning out of your life is to go through the darkness and go through the down pieces because otherwise you wouldn't appreciate the upside, right? If you just live this life where everything was great and you know every single day you had everything you wanted, like you'd get bored. You'd get absolutely so bored and you wouldn't appreciate anything and you would start doing things to actually sabotage it. Right? Oh, everything is too good. I'm bored. I'm going to create a problem for myself because we inherently need problems, right? Humans, just especially as men, we inherently need problems to solve. So if we have creative problems to solve, such as how do I start a business? How do I fix my dating life? How do I get in shape? How do I become a better version of myself? Those are constructive problems that can give you beneficial outcomes that make your life better. Mm-hmm. But when you don't have any real problems, people make up problems to be upset about, right? Don't yeah. believe me? Go check the internet. The internet is full of people that have it so good. They have to imagine problems to be upset about so that they can feel like they have some sort of righteous struggle in the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Virtue signaling and all that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Now, uh, let me talk about my experience a little bit. See, the whole reason that Zach's even on here is because I went through what it is that he does. You know what I mean? I can vouch for this specifically you know like it was an experience that was super transformative for me and uh i've said it now probably a dozen times you know like this is like no hyperbole this is no exaggeration this was probably the most um 
intense experience that I personally have ever dealt with, you know, or I shouldn't say dealt with, but uh, th that I've experienced, you know, and look, man, I've been around the block a few times, you know what I mean? It's not like I, I live in bubble wrap. And so, the, the you know, mm -hmm. the, this just happens the to be the time. most extreme because I've never had extreme yeah. intense experiences before. No, that, that that's not the case at all. You know, uh, like I've, like I said, been through, been around the block more than a few times. All right. So, um, so when I say this, I'm saying this with sincerity and I'm saying it with, uh, a little bit of reference experience here. So, uh, and on top of that, I got to witness, um, I don't know, about 10 or so of, of the ceremonies, you know what I mean? So, uh, so I got to be firsthand observing as well, uh, which was uh, a really dope experience uh, in, in and of itself. But um, for me, you know, what, what I really liked was the fact that the, the questions that you were asking beforehand, you know, in that, what is it that you want to get out of this with no expectation that that is actually what's going to be dealt with. You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 my understanding would be is that you're asking that to just to kind of get the subconscious and the, um, you know, just yeah. kind of get your mind going a little bit. Would, would that be accurate to say? Or Yeah. So many people do psychedelics wrong. So many people do psychedelics wrong. Yeah. So many people do psychedelics wrong. A lot of people think that if I just take this substance, if I just take some stuff, if I get high, if I get fucked up, you know, or maybe I just like have this, oh, my friend got some stuff, so we'll just take it and see what happens. Like it's, you know, you're going deep into your operating system, right? This is not just having a drink. Like you're going into the fundamental operating system of the way that your mind exists in the world. And there are so many cases of people that have damaged themselves or permanently messed themselves up or others even worse from irresponsible use or from not knowing how to actually create the right experience right these aren't you don't just go do this for fun you just don't you just go do this like and see what happens like it's got to be done ceremonially and medicinally and you've got to give the mind a path to go on right you've got to do it for a reason for an intention and so that's why i'm so big whenever i work with these to make sure that one people are doing it for the right reasons Right? If somebody comes to me and they're like, oh, I just want to try and see, like, sorry, no, that doesn't work for me. And the other reason being, like, we've got to give, there's got to be a reason for it. We've got to give your mind that direction to go in this experience because I've seen there's, you know, for as beneficial as these can be and as good, much good press as they're getting, we don't hear about the bad stories, right? We don't hear about the people that have psychotic breaks because they were not medically screened ahead of time, mm -hmm. right? We don't hear about the people that come out of these experiences worse because of an irresponsible practitioner. You know, I have a friend that actually got messed up pretty badly by an amateur who had no idea what they were doing, clearly. Um, and it messed my friend up for like a year afterwards, just because some irresponsible idiot had access to some plants that he thought would be cool to charge people for. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big pet peeve of mine because I've spent, you know, two years of my life essentially apprenticing with doctors and shamans and people that actually study these things and understanding how to do these as a transformational experience and understanding not only it's not about the experience it's about what you do before and afterwards that really creates the transformation right and so my biggest complaint against the psychedelic community right now is you've got so many people out there that are like oh just take some ayahuasca just go do this thing go do that medicine and then they never actually do anything with it they never do it the integration they don't give people the actual transformational experience that they really need and so there's however there's tons of people out there that are waiting. I just need my next ayahuasca true experience. I just need my next meditation retreat. I just need my next one, my next one without actually like getting the real transformation from the first one. So yeah. that's why when I work with these, I'm so big on asking the right questions and having those conversations. And as you saw, you know, sometimes I will grill guys, I will drill guys down until they can formulate a very specific thought. Cool. Now we got it. Now we can go into the experience because we've given your mind the direction to go to give you the outcome that you want. But to me, there's no reason to just do these things for fun because we're playing with we're playing with fire here. Yeah. It can be unbelievably powerful transformational experiences. But you can also mess someone up really, really badly when done irresponsibly. Yeah. And that just shows that you take it seriously. It's not just something yeah. that's just like, hey, this will be fun. This will be cool. You know, like you yeah. take it as what it is and not like it's almost like somebody who uh abuses um, opioids. 
you know, like yeah. you get these painkillers and you get hooked on these painkillers because you just want to get high off the painkillers, you know, well now you, you've kind of messed yourself up. Right. And you're doing yeah. the adverse of that, you know, like you're actually using this for its intended purpose, as opposed to it being something recreational or just for kicks. Right. So that's really yeah. dope. And you know, the thing is, is that without that uh, conversation going into it, and the conversation coming out of it, all I'm left with is an experience that's kind of nebulous, uh, just kind of ethereal. And, you know, it's like, yeah, it was amazing, but I mean, eh, but like, I don't really, I, I, I'm not able to like put those pieces together. You know what I mean? And so that, that was the thing that was super beneficial for me is, you know, like you and I talked about it, like, well, there, and then, you know, uh, throughout the course of the retreat and things like that off and on. Um, but even now, dude, like, I, it kind of sucks that I got sick, you know, like coming back from mm -hmm. the retreat and everything, you know, just, it just didn't feel good. You know what I mean? And so I, I feel like that kind of like sucked a little bit out of it, but nonetheless, um, like today, like I said, it's probably about the first day that I'm about 95%, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much almost good. And like today I feel great and everything, everything that we talked about, uh, it post the, the ceremony, um, and then through the retreat, everything that we talked about is still, it, it's, it's there, man, you know, um, and for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly, uh, kind of break down my experience, uh, you know, when, when I finally got that last, uh, that last hit that kind of put me out, uh, the last thing I remember was fall that that's it, you know? And then once, uh, like cognitively, I guess in the, in the physical world, that's the last thing that I hmm. remember is kind of falling backwards. But then what I thought was happening, I, I thought was like, like real in the real physical world sense was you and Justine holding me down and I'm like violently like swinging, you know what I mean? Like just trying mm -hmm. to knock shit out, you know? And, and I was like screaming like, ah, you know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. going to town on whatever was going to present itself in front of my fists, I guess. And, uh, and like, I thought that was legit. And then when I was started like kind of calming down and stuff like that, I remember like both of you just kind of like letting my arms go and I was just able to just relax. And I, I remember thinking like, man, I got a lot of talking to do this weekend with the amount I'm yelling, my throat is going to be hoarse. <laughs> you know, I remember, I remember thinking that. And, uh, but then everything was just kind of like funny to me. And I felt like very euphoric as I was kind of coming out of this. And I remember when I, when I started kind of realizing like, okay, I'm coming out of this now. Like I'm actually laying on this floor um, I remember the first thing I said, at least to the best of my memory was like, Justine, you better call or you, cops are going to come knocking on your door. Cause they're going to think somebody got killed in here, you know, because <laughs> I, I thought I was screaming, you know, and apparently I wasn't like, it was just guttural growls type of thing. Correct. So yeah, you laid there, you know, lightly, uh, lightly growling, but it was, you know, it was unbelievably, it was quiet, right. You had to be there to really hear it. Yeah. And like the cool thing, what I really appreciated about your transformation too, was this is why talking about it in the integration afterwards is so beneficial, right? Because if we just let you go with that experience, then you would just have had an experience, like you said, yeah. but it was talking about it and really looking for the, the disconnect, right? So what, what did we, what did I observe, right? I observed that you were, it looked like something wanted to get out that wasn't coming out, mm -hmm. right? It was like this stifled growl, I think would be the best way to describe it. And through matching up my observations ver with your internal perception, right? So if your internal perception is that I'm screaming and letting it on, thrashing around, I have to be held down, but outside we're like, yeah, you're just kind of making a little bit of noise, right? It's a mirror. Everything that happens in there is a mirror and your experience is going to be unique to you, right? So right. anybody listening to this, don't have any, if you, if you ever do this in any capacity, don't have any expectations because your experience is going to be truly unique to what you need. But for you, when we look at, okay, he thinks he's screaming, growling and letting it all out. But in reality, he's not, you know, that was the basis of our conversation afterwards, right? Was where in your life are you holding back? Where are you not letting out what you really want to say? Mm -hmm. And through that conversation, you know, it came out that I'm, you know, in the past, you 
maybe operated without a filter and said some things that were hurtful or damaging for people. And since you've grown and recognized that, you wanted to make sure and be mindful of that, that you're not doing that anymore. So as a result, you're holding yourself back from the people who need you to be you and be real. Yeah. My favorite thing about your transformation was that during that conversation, you had some resistance to it, right? It was, um, I remember I asked you, you know, what would it be like if you dropped the filter and just said what you needed to say and like, you know, let, really let it out what you want to be, right? And there was a lot of fear on, well, if I say something that I hurt people or upset people or offend people, you know, and I remember like when we left, you had to, you had to, you took off, after, uh, you had to go after that. But I remember the last kind of thing we talked about was, look, don't, you don't have to accept it but just marinate on it, right? Ask yourself, what would it be like? What would be possible if I didn't hold myself back? And I said what I needed to say with the awareness that sometimes I take things too far, I can hurt people. And as well as the skill to know that if I do that, when I do that, I can walk it back. I can apologize. I can do damage control. And so I remember you left in kind of thinking about it, right? In that pondering state. The next time, then a couple hours later, you got up and you addressed the group of guys and you just fully, it was a beautiful transformation because you got up and you owned it. You said, look, guys, I apologize. I've been holding back on you. I have not been bringing myself. I have not been telling you what you need to hear. And that ends now. And you just brought this new fire and enthusiasm to the guys. And it went over like guys, were, I can tell guys were loving it. Guys appreciated it. Yeah. The reality is men, that's what we need, right? We don't need to be held back on, right? Yeah. If I'm fucking up, tell me I'm fucking up. Don't like, we don't need our feelings protected. We don't need to be now you don't want to be dicks to people, right? You don't want to hurt people or be intentionally rude to people, but there is a lost skill in society of delivering tough love because everybody's fragile and easily offended and afraid to be told that they're fucking up when they're fucking up. And so as a result of this, we've created this culture where we cannot call people out for their mistakes, for their flaws, even as men. But that's so backwards because as men, the, one of the most valuable things that we can do for each other is to call each other out, yeah. call each other up and lift each other up and for me, my worst nightmare, my worst nightmare is to be doing something where I'm fucking up, where I'm in the wrong and nobody tells me, right? Just people just let more than happy to let me burn, let me hang myself without actually correcting it. And to me, that's not, that's not manly. That's not masculine. That's not what we're here for, right? right? We are here to sharpen each other and lift each other up. And the only way we do that is by being real and raw with each other and coming to it from a place of, of love, right? We come to it with love, with construction, with trying to help each other get better, but we're not, you're not doing anybody a service by holding back on them or coddling them or telling them that everything is okay when everything's not okay. That's just yeah. not, that, that's not okay. You know, I've adopted yeah. kind of a new mantra uh, since then, as I've, you know, now I've had a lot of time to really think, think it through, you know, uh, a couple of weeks anyway. And uh, that mantra being truth is more important than consequences, you know? And so, uh, that, that's just something I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, like really starting to own, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I don't think that I would have came to that conclusion without this, but there, and, and you know, what's so funny, dude, is that like, like you say, like you get what you need, not necessarily what you want, but you get what, what you need. And, but you're asking on the onset, what is it that you want to kind of like deal with or let go, or, you know, what do you, what do you want out of this experience? And what I found interesting was, is a lot of the things that we talked about was in regards to me coaching, you know what I mean? Now it didn't directly address, I think exactly what I was talking about, but indirectly with what I got out of the experience, it still handled the stuff that we talked about previous to that, even though it wasn't the, the way that I would have expected it was exactly what I needed. It's almost like a two bird, uh, one stone type of type of thing. I, I help with something else, but indirectly help with exactly what it was that I was trying to get out of it to begin with, you know. And um, there's like three other things that I re that really came out of this for me. You know, I've never felt more centered in, in my entire. I feel just present. You know what I mean? Uh, like, and, and as an extension of that. Like, and I don't know if you if you have heard this said by anybody uh, that have, has done this before or not, but I've been ADD my whole life, man. You know, like, I, I mean, I'm not just because I say it, I, like I'm, you know, diagnosed with it, you know, I'm mm -hmm. supposed to be on medication for it, which I never take. I haven't taken it in years, mm -hmm. but that's gone. It is 
it just is like I'm 100% focused on what I'm doing and whenever I'm doing anything there's zero distraction there's zero clutter um the way I liken it is like having like 10 windows open on your computer and you got a bunch of programs running too how well is that computer going to run Shabam you're a computer guy how well no exactly there's a limited amount of processing and ram that you can use for one task you know that's like right it will always be a struggle yeah it, it'll work probably but yeah. it's not going to work efficiently it's not going to work okay. at, at at its highest yeah. uh, performance and so man that's it's just gone man there's just no clutter at all uh and then lastly uh something that i never really kind of felt like i dealt with though I, I kind of recognized this in me a little bit but I didn't really have a way to define it but um imposter syndrome you know like I never really like I, like for instance man I'll keep it a buck you know like I would get intimidated uh to a degree by Jared Cosmo and Jamie you know like like Jared is basically a psychologist you know he's very formally trained uh Jamie has a master's degree uh, Cosmo, I don't know how formally educated he is, but I, he's been doing this a long time, you know, and they're all well-spoken and they all know exactly what they're talking about and exactly what they're doing. And anytime that I would feel like I'm sharing a platform with them or doing a class with them or being on a stage or, or, or whatever else, I always felt like, man, what, why am I here? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just a guy, man, you know, like that's it, you know, but at the same time, after that experience, like when, when I stepped up in, in the, 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 uh, the talk that you, the, that you were addressing Zach, none of that, like I knew exactly where I was supposed to be. I knew I belonged there as much as anybody else, you know? And so I, now I don't feel like that at all. Not one bit. And, and that's not to say like, you know, um, I'm just as, uh, we'll say, articulate as Jared or something like that, or as knowledgeable as Jared in, in certain things. Of course not. But at the same time, that doesn't diminish who I am and what it is that I do. Just because he's articulate doesn't make me an idiot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> you know, Schwab's like, no, you're pretty much an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think like, uh, personally, like the thing is, uh, I mean, I've, seen Jared's videos and all some like for some people that works like I mean I am the sort of been like you know more articulate works from but there are some people who prefer it to be simple and that's where you know your talent comes in like some people you relate to some people he relates to it's like everyone is unique that way it's not like there's no what you'd say fit to every person like yeah. everyone like you know you have your own role like you fit a separate niche that is slightly different like you know like you like Okay, most people who have like inner game issues are like, you know, go to you. Like, just take an example in Modern Flirting Program. How many people reach out to you asking different questions? That just oh, shows, sorry. right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I got, exactly. I got one on, one on ones lined up all day. Yeah, exactly. So that shows, right? Because you are more comfortable to speak to as opposed to someone else who is, even though he's more articulate, they feel like, okay, this guy is like a very big barrier compared to you. You're yeah. like, you know, the friendly uncle or like, you know, very close friend, that sort of a vibe. So you're just like, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I get that. I, I think I kind of have a little bit of a, what I like to say is kind of like an everyman appeal, you know? Yeah. I, I think that, I think that's true. Um, but, uh, we're running a little bit short on time here. So Zach, what, if, if somebody's interested, man, and they just want to know more or they want to book you for a session or whatever the case might be, uh, what's the best way that they can get in touch with you? Yeah, so right now, best way is through social media, uh, Instagram at Zach with an H, Z-A-C-H, Zach David Paul. Uh, I'm on Facebook as well, Zach David, Facebook.com slash Zach David Paul. And then LinkedIn is the same. Um, the website is sealtoshark.com. However, I'm in the middle of a brand overhaul, so that one's not going to be around uh, it's not going to be my main channel, but yeah, Instagram, if you want the fastest response for me, uh, reach out to me on Instagram and uh, send me a message. I'm more than happy to hear your story, hear what's going on and uh, offer you my best possible advice to your specific situation. Okay, cool. So I'll link up those, uh, the social medias in, in the description here. So if anybody wants to reach out, please do, do yourself a favor, man. You know, like 
there's a reason that Zach is on here. Okay. Like yeah. I, it, it's because of the experience that I went through and the uh, experiences that I've seen other people go through and watching their lives transform as well. Uh, it, it, Zach, you don't even know this probably, but like uh, myself and uh, uh, several of the people, uh, Justine included, you know, like we've had debriefs, you know, where we're like, really like really working through what we talked about like you and I talked about what, what like maybe you and her talked about and stuff like that and just kind of like really working through it and and all that kind of thing like that's how powerful this was man and so do not under any circumstances sleep on this don't chalk it up as to some hippy dippy stuff because I think anybody who knows me would know like that is not Dale's get down like you will not see Dale at Burning Man Okay, you will not see Dale at your local burn event. Like, no, like I am not that dude. Okay, but what's real is what's real. And if it's something that can help you, if it's something that can be instrumental in just making a transformative uh, uh, change in your life, why not? Why not at least investigate? You know, if you're at the end of your rope, just like Zach was talking about, if you if you're at the end of the rope and you've been doing the, the, the self-help and I believe you me, man, I'm, I'm a big advocate of self-help and all that kind of thing. But if you're finding like, this isn't working, this isn't working, this isn't working, this isn't working, man, reach out. That's all you have to do, you know, and, and see if it's for you. If it's not fine, but if it is take that leap, just like, or that step in faith that he was talking about, like in Indiana Jones in the last crusade, Indy didn't even see the bridge. He had to yep. take the step out first and then seeing something supported his weight. Then the next step. And then, Oh, there it is. Over on there. There's the, uh, uh, what's that chalice called? The, um, Holy grail. No. Yeah. The Holy grail. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So mm. the Holy grail on the other side of that ravine, you know? So look, and that's where the toad poison is, is inside of that, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Holy grail. Box. So, that's what's up. So listen, guys, I say this all the time. You know, if you got good information out of this, if something spoke to you, something resonated with you, you can always reach out to me. Of course, you can reach out to Zach and it, you know, specifically for this. Absolutely. One hundred percent. But if you got something out of it, please subscribe to the channel, man. Share it with somebody that, you know, needs to see it. All right. I know that, you know, people that need to hear this kind of content share it with them be that guy that is going to help one of your brothers it's going to help one of the people in your life and level up together you know stop making it a you thing make it a, a we an us thing okay so that's us up uh i will see you guys uh next week all right so until then salute